Okay, hello, here we are. We've made it through to day six, the very last day in this series of Life Code Global. And I can see you are all coming back to join me again. Let's see who we've got. We've got uh, Peter and Dave and Albert and Herman, yes. So, um, yeah, guys, if you want to just confirm that uh, you can see and hear me clearly and you can see Eleanor, who is, as usual, here with me to kick off the day. Um, I will hand over. I'm just going to just going to wait for somebody to say yes. That's all good. So. Um. Some initial work, uh, some responses in the chat. I'm not seeing any. Can somebody just say yes, I can hear you. That would be nice. Let's see. You guys are on freeze frame. Ah, hello, Brian. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Terry says we're not moving yet. No sound, no video. Oh dear. Oh. Hmm. Oh, they say we're frozen. Oh dear. Hmm. Can I restart my video? That help? Um, we could try. Let's both try turning on and off cameras and, and see if that works. Okay. If that doesn't help, we can go out and in again. Oh, we're live. Brian says we're live. Yay. Thank you, Clarence. Hooray. Good. There it is. Excellent. Wonderful. All right, then. That was a slightly sticky start to, uh, to day six, but, but we're good. Okay. Okay, good. Over to you then, Eleanor. Wow us with your last section. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Okay, so um, today we will be looking at using JSON as a data source and as a way of communicating with web APIs and using it in live code. So before we start, I'm going to say that I'm not really a, I'm not really a web expert. I couldn't tell you how to write a web service as it was. So if you do have any questions about that, of course, you can post them in our Slack and we will, we will try and help. But what we're really looking at here is how to take some JSON. Um, we can, you know, write it up in a text file, but how to use it in a live code app. So we're looking very much at the app end of it rather than perhaps the server or API end of it. So we're going to be using an existing API and just getting the information and using it in our app. So I think we'll just get started with our videos. As always, if you've got any questions, you can pop them in our chat and we will have a look at them in between the, the videos that we have already prepared. Thanks everyone. Just get this set up. So in this final beginners session, we will be looking at using JSON with live code apps. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's a language independent data format that was originally derived from JavaScript, but most languages can now generate and parse JSON format data, including live code. So it's a minimal human readable format for structured data. It's self-describing and easy to understand. It's text only, and it can be written and edited by hand. It can be used as a data format by any programming language and is a very com common format used to transmit data between a server and an application. So why would we choose to use JSON? So when you're exchanging data between an app and a server or a browser and a server, the data can only be text. So since the JSON format is text only, it can easily be sent to and from a server and it can be used as a data format on its own. So not coming from a server, but actually stored in a local file, in a JSON file, for 
by any programming language. So live code has built-in functions to convert between JSON strings and live code arrays. So it's also a really useful way if you've got data in an array and you want to save it out to file, then you can actually convert it to JSON. So you can convert it to text and save it to a file that you can then actually read and edit if you want to. Of course, live code has the um, array encode and array decode functions as well, but those will uh, convert your array data to binary data, which obviously you can't read or edit by hand. So if you actually want to store array data in a local file uh, for, for storage, if you it could be a profile of a user, it could be data that your app uses that you want to save in between uses of the app, then converting it to, uh, to a JSON format and saving it in a text file is a really good way to do that as well. So JSON syntax is derived from JavaScript object notation syntax. So it's sets of uh, name value pairs uh, separated by commas. You can use curly braces to hold objects. So uh, an object in a JSON file can also be a JSON object. And you can uh, store arrays using square brackets. So there are six types of data that JSON values can be. They can be strings, numbers, JSON objects, arrays, booleans, or null. So those are the six types of data that you can store in a JSON file. So a name value pair consists of a field name or a, a label or a key followed by a colon and then a value. So the simplest one are strings. So it's just the, so you open the curly brackets to start your JSON object. You give the key or the name, so that's a string in quotes, and then a colon, and then the, the value is also a string in quotes. So for example, here we have name colon John, so that key value pair for somebody's name. Numbers are very similar, but the number doesn't go into quotes because it's a number, not a string. So the key is still a string, and then you've got the colon, and then you've got the value. So JSON numbers have to be integers or floating point numbers. You can then use, you can then store arrays using square brackets. So here we have a staff array and then we have the list of uh, staff members of the development team. And you can see that those are in square brackets and each one individually is in quotes and they're separated by commas. So that would come out as a simple, uh, simple array, just one level deep. And also you can have JSON objects within your JSON file. For example, here we have an employee object within our JSON object and it has three uh, name value pairs, the name, the age, and the city. And those are enclosed in curly brackets. And then finally, we have booleans and null. So booleans are either true or false. And again, those are not um, in quotes because that would make them strings. And finally, the last option is that you can have a null value as well. So live code includes uh, two functions for converting between live code arrays and JSON. So there's array to JSON, which takes a uh, live code array and converts it to a JSON string and JSON to array, which takes a JSON string and converts it to an array. So the array to JSON function has uh, a few parameters. So it's got the array, it's got the force root type, and it's got uh, the pretty value. So the force root type parameter allows you to tell the conversion to force uh, part of the JSON to be something other than the default. So you can force an array to be a JSON object, you can force a number to be a string. Um, so that allows you to force the type that the automatic conversion chooses. And the pretty parameter tells the function that you want the output to be nicely formatted. So these functions are both part of the merge JSON library. So if you are using it, do remember that um, you'll need to include that uh, merge JSON library if you want to use these functions when you're building your standalone. Okay, so having a look at array to JSON. So here we have our simple staff array with the names of the members of the development team. And so if we want to convert that to JSON, then what we do is we build our array. And then at the end, we just uh, put array to JSON 
and then we pass the dev team array into field one. And if we pass it the pretty parameter, if we set that to be true, then that will come out nicely formatted on different lines and indented. So that makes it a bit more readable. They're both equally valid JSON, just depends um, if you're going to be reading it, if it's going to be read by a human or edited, then you might want to pretty format it so that it's a bit more readable and easy to see how everything is laid out. And similarly, JSON to array will take a JSON string and it will um, convert it into a live code array, as we can see with that little screenshot from the variable watcher there. So it'll take that JSON string at the top, the staff colon, square bracket, Stephen Crichton, Heather, etc., and it'll convert it into uh, a staff array that we can then use directly in our live code app. Oh, great. Okay. So, okay, so that was just a bit of an, an introduction to JSON, how it's formatted, what it can be used for, things like that. So in the next section, we will be making a small app where we're actually going to use a JSON file as a data source. So just a local text file that holds JSON data so we can have a look at it, see what it looks like, uh, see how we can use it. Um, and then after that, we'll actually be using a web API. So in the next section, we'll just be using um, a local file. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions at the moment before we move on. Let me have a quick look through the chat. Okay, so we don't have any questions at the moment, so we'll just move straight on to the next video. But like I said, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat and then we can try and address them after this video. So we'll just get this queued up now. So the first example we're going to look at is using JSON as a data source to live code. So it's a good format for a data source as it's human readable and simple to process. And you could use it to store data, uh, for example, a list of contacts or a user profile. If you have a sort of small amount of information, if you don't want to use a database, then JSON is a nice structured way to store data. You'd also use it to specify your UI and then in combination with script only stacks, it can be a really useful tool if you want to use version control. So you can specify your UI, your layout in a JSON file. You can have uh, the code for your app in script-only stacks, and then you're minimizing the amount of information that's stored in the binary files, which is useful if you're using version control software, whether that's GitHub or something else, and maximizing the amount of data that's in text files that can then be parsed and diffed and use all those tools is a good idea if you're wanting to use version control. So what we'll be doing is we'll be building just a very simple uh, navigation menu. So I've got a simple JSON file here, menu.json. Um, so this is an array with five elements, music, videos, movies, TV, TV shows and podcasts, and that's stored in a JSON file. And we'll read that in and we'll use that to build our UI. So if we come back to live code, we're just going to create a new stack. And I'll just change the name of this stack to, I'll call it UI example. And I'll just change the size. So we'll go for five, six, eight, and 320. So we'll have a little landscape stack here. And I'm just gonna change the background color to white. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, add uh, scrolling list fields, which we'll use as our menu. So I'll just pop this on here and we'll call this menu. And of course we can change some properties here to make it look a bit nicer. Change the highlight color. Okay, so now that we've got our simple UI set up, we need to actually load in the data from the JSON file, convert it to an array, and then populate our field with the items. So we're going to do this in the card script. So when the card is open, so on pre-open card, we're going to call load menu, and then we'll add our command load menu down here. 
So the first thing we need to do is we need to build the path to our JSON file and we're going to assume that it's in the same folder as our stack. So we'll have a variable with our file in it. And our JSON file is called menu.json. We then need to get the contents of that file, which will be our JSON data. And because it's actually a text file, we can use file here. And then we need to convert that JSON data into a live code array. Okay, so I'm just going to put a breakpoint here so that we can test this out. We'll save our stack in the same folder as our JSON file. And now if I open up the message box, I should just be able to call pre-open card. And it's paused here, so you can see there's our JSON file. Here's the JSON data in that variable. And here is our array, so numerically keyed with the elements from the JSON array. So now what we need to do is we need to build that into a list, into a, a return separated list that we can put into this field to create our menu. So we'll have a variable T menu items. And what we'll do is we'll loop through our array and build our um, string of items. So we've built our list, return separated, deleted the last character because that would just be a return at the end, and then we just set the text of our field to the list we've built. Okay, so now if we call pre-open card again, then we get our list of items there. And if we want to add another item, then we can just add it to our JSON file. Save that. And then if we call pre-open card again, then it'll automatically update our UI. So all that information about what is in the UI is just in our JSON file. And although I did this on the card script, you could do all this code in a script only stack and set it as a behavior on the card. And then you'd have a very small amount of data in your binary stack. And actually to add an item to the list there, we didn't actually have to make any changes to our binary stack. We just changed our JSON file and regenerated the UI. Awesome. Uh, that, that, uh, I, I didn't know you could look into a variable like that and see on the list of the, the, the JSON oh. array. Yeah, it's really useful. I use that all the time to see what's in my variable. Well, Quite often I don't know that. Which is why things go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, carry on. Okay, so again, um, if anybody's got any questions, just pop them in the chat. We don't have any questions at the moment, which means we're probably going to get through this quite quickly. Our next video is a bit longer, but um, not that long. So if you do have any questions, do pop them in the chat. And since this is the last beginner session, they don't necessarily have to be about what we're talking about today. If you've got any questions about any of the things we've covered in these six months, six days, however you want to look at it, of, um, of Live Code Global, or if you've got any general questions that you want to ask, we do have, we will have a bit of time as part of this session. So if you've got any questions at all, actually, um, do feel free, do feel free uh, to pop them in the chat and we will have a look at them. 
in the meantime, I'll start up the last video. So in the last video, we're actually going to use um, a web API, which returns us uh, JSON data, which we can then use in our app. So rather than it being in a local file, we're actually going to um, go out to a web API and request the information, and then we're going to use it in our app. So um, I will just get that queued up now and we'll start that video, and then we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. So as well as being used as a data source, JSON has become a popular data format for transmitting data from a web service. It's more lightweight than XML, it's human readable, and it's easy to parse and use. In this example, we'll be using a news API to create a small news app. The API we are using is a free API and you can get an API key at the link. And it returns JSON metadata for the headlines currently published on a range of news sources and blogs. So if you want to recreate this yourself, you'll just need to go and sign up for an API key that you can then use in the stack. Okay, so I've set up a very simple UI for our app here. So this is just a header bar. This is a data grid that we'll use to display the list of news articles. These are our news sources. I've chosen BBC, CNN and The Verge. Uh, the API actually has, I think, 17 different news sources that you can use, but I've just chosen three here. And then we've got a second card, which just has a browser and a um, header bar with the ability to go back. And this card will be used to display the full content of an article. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to load our articles. So again, we'll do this on the card script here and on pre-open card, we'll call load articles. And then we'll have our load articles command down here. Now, in the previous example, the first thing we had to do was get the path to our JSON file. In this case, the first thing we need to do is get the path to the web API URL. So we'll build it up. So we put the base URL, so it's HTTPS, newsapi.org slash v1 slash articles. And then the source. And at this point, we need to pass the source that we want, which will be whichever of these buttons is highlighted here. So BBC News, CNN, or The Verge. So just to quickly show you actually, the names of these buttons. So this is BBC dash news, this is CNN, and this is the dash Verge. So these are the same as the name of the source that you have to pass in here. So all we need to do here is get the highlighted button name of this group of sources. So this is actually a group. Um, so these are radio buttons that I've put icons on. So by creating radio buttons and giving them an icon and a highlight icon, then you don't need to do anything else. It'll, by grouping together radio buttons, it'll always automatically ensure that only one of them is highlighted at a time and it'll unhighlight the others. And then you can just get the highlighted button name, which will return the name of the highlighted button in the group. So here we do source equals, and then we have the highlighted button name of group sources. And then we also have to pass the API key. So it's API key equals, and then I've got it stored in a custom property of my stack. So and the C API key. Of this stack. And we'll put that all into our T URL variable. So I've put my API key in a custom property of the stack. This is actually the only place where I'll be calling it, but if you were calling the API in multiple different places, it'd be useful just to have it in one place that you would only need to update uh, in one place, one time, if you need to make any changes to it. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to call that, we need to get that URL to get back our JSON data. So another variable here. And this time we'll put URL T URL into T JSON. 
So this is just like what we did with the with the file, but in this case we're getting it from a web service. And then again, we will convert it into an array. And that will give us back um, uh, an array. And the array has a, an element called articles. And in that element, there are all the information about the articles from that particular news source. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to set the DG data of group article list, which is the name of our data grid, to T array articles. So the, um, the information that comes back in the JSON, there's quite a lot of information in there. But what we want to do is we just want to display the list of articles. So we get the articles key, and that is numerically keyed, one, two, three, four, five, which is what a data grid needs. And just to quickly show you how I've set up the data grid. So it's a data grid form. So if we have a look at the row template here, you'll see that it has an image called thumbnail, a field called title, and another field called description. And if we have a look at the script for the data grid, on fill in data, we set the text of field title to pdataRay title, same for description, and we set the file name of the thumbnail image to the URL to image that's passed in uh, from the API. And that's all we need to do in there. I, I haven't set up any code for resizing it or anything. So all we're doing in this particular case is filling in the data with the relevant elements from the array. Okay, so now if we call pre-open card, we should see a list of articles. And there's our list of articles. So something about the Justice League, um, Netflix, drones. So these are the most recent articles from this uh, source. So it's the Verge that we have selected at the moment. And just to show you again, we'll have a look at what all the information that's passed, it, that's given to us from the API is. So if I put a breakpoint here and then call pre-open card again, we can have a look at the array. It's a bit easier to look at the array than to look directly at the JSON data. So you'll see there's uh, a sub array there, articles, and it tells us what the source was, the status and sort by. And if we have a look in the articles, as we said, they're numerically keyed. So if we look at article number one, we've got the author, the description, published at, so that's a published date. So you could include that if you wanted to, the title, the URL, which is the actual URL to the full article, which we will be using in a second, and the URL to the image, which is what we're using as our thumbnail here. So I've chosen just to show the thumbnail, the title, and the description, but you could uh, change that to include as much information as you want. And we've chosen just to use the articles element here, and we've not done anything with these ones, but this is all the information that is passed back by the API. Now we also want our user to be able to switch between the data sources. So we will select our sources group and we'll add some code here. So we'll say on mouse up and all we have to call here is load articles because the load articles command actually uses the highlighted button name of the group. And as I mentioned, because they're radio buttons, they will automatically highlight. So all we need to do is tell it to refresh itself by loading the articles again, and it will pick up the selected source from our group. So we can test that out. So we can see what the top articles from the BBC News are. So here are the top BBC articles. We can then choose CNN, see what CNN articles are. And we can go back to the Verge. So as I said, there's more uh, sources that you can use. I just chose these three to show how we can switch between them. Now, of course, people will also probably want to be able to read the full article 
not just have a look at the, the title here. So what we want to do is when the user selects an article here, it'll move to our second card, the one with the browser on it, and it will display the full uh, text of the article. So we'll have, so we'll select our article list, open up the code for that, and again, we'll handle mouse up, which is what we get when the user selects a row in a data grid. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find out which row they highlighted. So to do that, we get the DG highlighted line of the data grid group. So that'll give us the line number of the highlighted article. Then we get the data array associated with that particular line. So we get our article data. So we get the DG data of line. And then of our highlighted line, so of T highlighted line. And we'll put that into our array. So it's a group article list into our T article data variable. And what we can then do is we can get the article URL. Because if you remember when we first looked at the article data that we received from the API, one of the elements was the URL to the actual article. So we'll set the C article URL. So we'll set a custom property on our certain second stack, which is card article two, and it'll be T article data and it's called just it's called URL. So that is the, the URL to the full article. So uh, you remember that just because I'm not actually displaying the article URL anywhere in the data grid row, that doesn't mean that that information has been lost. All that information is still associated with each row in the data grid. So you can still access it like this. You don't have to put everything into fields or anything like that. That, that data will um, be preserved. So we've set the C article URL of our card. So now what we want to do is we want to go to that card and we'll use a visual effect push left fast just to get a nice um, effect. And then we'll go to card article. So now if I select one of uh, these articles, so let's have a look at this one. Then when we go to the card, the browser is used to display the full article to the user. So there's a little bit of code in here already. So all we're doing is on open card, we're setting the URL property of our browser widget to the C article URL of this card. And on close card, we're clearing it. And the reason that we're doing it that way is just to get a slightly nicer effect for the user. We're doing it on open card so that we move to the card first. So we move to the card and then we show the article. If we did it on pre-open card, it would have to load and it would take longer to see the transition between the cards. And similarly, when we close card, we want to set the URL of the browser to empty because that means that when we come back to the card, it'll already be empty and then we can just load the article that we selected. If we left it set, we'd probably come back to the card. We'd briefly see the previous article and then it would reload and show us the new one, but it's a slightly nicer effect um, if you're going from an empty browser to the article you want rather than from the previous article back to this one. And then of course in our header bar we've got a little bit of code just to go back to the index card. In this case we're pushing right fast. So the whole thing we can go back, we can change to the BBC News, so we can then choose the story that we're interested in. It'll take us to the browser card, then it will load up the new article, we can read it, and then we can go back to our list again. Okay, so that's our simple little news app using uh, an API that provides JSON data. So you can see we've made a nice little news app here. There's not a lot of code in it, there's not a lot of work to be done, and there's lots and lots of different uh, free APIs that you could use 
to um, either to implement a full app, kind of like we've done here, or just to use them as part of your app. So you might want to use news as part of your app just as an extra feature or something like that. You might want to do weather. You might be able, if we go back to some of the apps we've looked at previously, we had our movie database. You might be able to access, there's a few, I think, um, APIs that provide movie data so you can just search for a title and then you can pull in things like the director and the cast list and things like that and you can pull that in from an API rather than having to implement that all yourself so there's lots of ways that using web APIs um, can reduce your workload or allow you to add features to your apps and using JSON is a really nice way of doing that because it's so simple to use and it's easy to read you can look at the files you can see exactly what is stored in there and hopefully everybody will find that useful. So thanks very much everybody. Hey, so hey. I hope you find that useful. I did think of something that um, I wanted to show you which is just to quickly go through the standalone application settings um, for when you're actually building your app. So I'll just uh, share my screen and then we can have a look at that. And then we have got one question. Startup, the app which you can um, download from the resources for uh, this session. So we'll have a look at the news app. At the moment, what I'm seeing is your browser going off to infinity, Eleanor. Ah, okay, uh, two seconds then. <laughs> okay, that's not useful. Is that better? Hang on. Um, now we've got a strange blank square. Did you share your whole screen or did you just share the browser? Oh, sharing and then I'll share again. Yeah, try again, I think. Probably easiest. <laughs> I think we'll be all right again in a minute. There we go. That's much better. Great. Okay, so this is just um, this is just the app here, and I just wanted to quickly show you the standalone application settings. So if I open up the standalone application settings, um, I've chosen to select inclusions for the standalone application. You can, of course, use um, the automatic search, but I tend to use select inclusions just so that I can make sure that everything is there. Um, in our copy files, I've just got an images folder, which is just the, the icons here. That's all that's in there. Um, then the more important part is the inclusions pane. So these are just the widgets that I've used. There's the header bar and the browser ticked. Um, scroll down until I find it. The important one here is that you include Merg JSON, Merge JSON. Never been sure how to say that, but Merg JSON because that's the library that provides the array to JSON and JSON to array functions that we use. And then if we have a look at iOS, there's a couple of things in here. The first is that I had to check the disable uh, ATS option to allow the app to use HTTP um, URLs as well as HTTPS URLs. And that was because I think the CNN links are HTTP rather than HTTPS. I think it was CNN, it was one of the sources was using HTTP. So I had to make sure that I had that ticked so that those could be loaded. And for Android, just to make sure that we've got internet selected so that we can actually uh, connect to the API. So those are the standalone application settings that you would need to use. Most important ones are to include, to make sure that the library is included and then for iOS, it's just disable ATS and for Android, it's make sure you your internet turned on. So those are just the, the standalone application settings that you'd need to actually deploy, deploy this. And then we had one other question, um, which was about um, loading XML and converting it to JSON. So I'll quickly show you a very small example of that. Just bring that. Uh, preferences example stack back up. So this is a preferences example um, and it is one of our lessons 
and it's um, showing you how to read in and parse an XML file. I've modified it slightly here, but first we'll have a look at the XML file. That should just be opening up. See if I can get this open. Okay, so here's our preferences XML file. So we've got a text color, a text size, an intro message, and some recent documents. It's decided to. Code of the load XML button here. Um, we seem to have lost your camera. Oh. And also, I mean, I, I don't know, did you mean to stop sharing? No, I didn't. No, you've come back to camera and we've lost your screen. Do you want to try sharing the screen again? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, entire screen. Can you see that, Heather? That's better. Yep, you're all good. Um, so all I've done is open up the stack. Um, I don't know if you saw the um, XML file, but here it is again. So it's a simple XML file with text color, text size, intro message, and some recent documents. And this is the code for our load XML button. So in here, all we're doing is loading our preferences. So the first thing we want to do is we are going to create our XML tree, and then we're going to process the preferences. So to create the XML tree. Is there any way you can make that code a bit bigger? Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> because it's really <laughs> rather small. I think I can make it. Is that better? That's better. Now I can read it, yes. OK, so the first thing we do is we um, read in our preferences file. So. We're getting the path to the XML file here. And then we are reading it in, just checking that we've managed to load it. And then we're using Rev XML create tree, passing it all the XML data, and that will give us back the ID of an XML tree, which will be a numerical ID. We then want to process our preferences tree, and we pass the ID of the XML tree that we've just created. And so what we do is we go through our tree, and we know uh, in this particular case, we know what the elements of the XML, what the nodes are, are called. So we're just going to access them directly. You could write something more generic if you wanted to. But in this case, we want to get the text color. So we use Rev XML node contents, which will return us the contents of the node that we tell it to have a look at. So we've got our ID of our XML tree, and we're looking at preferences text color. We're putting that into an array, we're doing the same for text size, intro message, and intro message size. So we're just building up an array with all the information from our XML file. For the recent documents, that's um, an array within the XML document. So we're getting the names of all the children using Rev XML child names, and then we're looping through those, um, creating a numerically keyed array inside our array. So a nested array in here. So once we've finished building our array, all we need to do is call our array to JSON function. And we'll just put it into a field so that we can have a look at it. Of course, we could put it straight into a file if we wanted to instead. So if I now go into run mode and click the button, there is our JSON data. And if I tell it to format it prettily, then bit more readable there. Again, this is maybe a bit small, so I'm just going to up the text size here a bit. Oh, that's better, yes. And stretch this out so that we can actually see it. So now we've got some nicely formatted JSON. There is our intro message, our intro message size, our recent documents, our text color, and our text size. So that's allowed us 
to really easily take our, uh, pref our XML preferences file and convert it to JSON. If I can just find the XML preferences file again, we can have a look and compare them. So I'll just open that in text edit this time. So you can kind of see there, there's, um, there's a mapping. Again, let me see if I can make this a bit bigger. Not actually sure where the text size is here. It was, yeah, if you went to back to um, format and then go to font and then go to bigger. Bigger. Okay, great. Thank you, Heather. Not too bigger, but it's a bit bigger, yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there we go. See how these elements, these um, nodes in our XML file, um, have been translated to JSON. There's our text color, and instead of having our XML text color, there's a JSON version of the text color. So it's a nice, easy way to take something in XML and convert it via a live code array straight into JSON format. Okay, let me come back to the let me come back to the um, to the webinar. Turn off. Uh oh, oh there you are. Okay, turn your camera on. Here we are. Oh, yeah. All good. Okay, so let me have a look. So um, Tim's asked, will the preferences app be included in the resources? Um, it's one of our lessons anyway, but I can add it to the resources for the um, for this lesson. So I'll get that uploaded after this lesson and you'll be able to download it from there. Um, and then do we have any other questions here? Um, Albert has a question, but I'm guessing that's probably more for you, Heather, about putting all the videos and documentation, everything together in one place. That's probably more of a Heather <laughs> question. <laughs> that will all happen. I'll get that done. Um, usually I get it done on Friday, but uh, it could be Monday. Who knows? Um, but it will all, be, it all appear in your account, Albert. You go and look in it, go into your Life Code account, look down the left hand navigation. Under the learning tab, you should see Life Code Global. And if you click on that, you'll find all the recordings, everything, and all the materials are included there. So if you go to the, there's a little download link. If you go into each lesson in that portal, there's a little download tab. Uh, which will show you everything that you've got. It'll be all the stacks, the video, the slides, everything that everything that every speaker gives me will go in there, so you'll get it. Yeah, so do we have any other questions for Eleanor? If not, I've got a, I've got a question for you guys. Uh, it's really nice to see you all here again. And as you probably know, I don't know how you could possibly not know if you don't, we are actually going to run Life Code Global again next year, Global, Life Code Global 2018. It's been so successful. People have loved it. People are, we're getting loads of good feedback on it. So we've just gone, okay, right, we'll do it again. So if you have suggestions for things that you guys would like us to cover, and you drop them into the chat. Well, what topics would you like? What, uh, what courses can we get Eleanor to show you next year? What, uh, what would you like Ali to do? Uh, what would you like outside speakers to provide? Give, give us some topics. What, what, what have we missed? What, what would you like to know? So I'm just gonna, just gonna wait for a little minute and hopefully you're all gonna be typing away furiously now. Uh, Kelly, what would you like to see? Um, I've had an I, I've we've had a suggestion from another group where uh, oh here we, here we go Terry says machine learning and AI with live code now that's interesting what do you think Eleanor could we cover that um I'm sure we could if we find somebody who knows a lot about machine learning um, yeah yeah I mean I guess I don't know if um, there's certainly some parts and projects other projects that that were worked that um are being worked on there's some of that in in there i'm not it's not something that i know a lot about but i think it would be a really interesting a really interesting topic and i'm sure it might be something that mm. some of our users actually do know do know a lot about so yeah so okay so 
uh, yes, if, if you know anyone that would be really good at presenting machine learning and AI, Terry, step up and <laughs> let us know. But uh, I might have put that to the team as well. Um, so yes, Mikey, I was about to say, uh, you already suggested hacking the IDE and I have put that to the team. So uh, it's very likely that we'll cover that, but we will see. I think that's a, I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think so. so it's, um, it's something that we sort of would like to be able to encourage people to do, to add features to even mm. just if they don't want to contribute them to GitHub or anything, you know, to be able to add things that you want to use to your IDE. So I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good yeah. suggestion. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, Bob Cole has asked, what does the effective word mean when used with opening a file name? Does that mean something to you, Eleanor? Yeah, so effective anywhere. It's not just used with file names. Um, for example, um, it's used with text sizes and text colors and things. So any properties that can be inherited. So if you've got a stack, for example, and you've got the uh, text size of the stack set to 18, um, the text size of each individual field might be empty, which allows it to uh, inherit from the stack. So if you say put the text size of field um, first name, it would probably return empty because you haven't set it individually. But the effective text size is actually 18 because it's effectively the text size that the field is using. So it's used usually with properties that um, are inherited. The effective text size is the same as the, the value of the inherited property, if that makes sense, because um, effectively that is the text size that's used in the field. And it's similar um, for the file name. The effective file name of a stack is where that stack, what the file name of that stack would would be. So um, just have I'm just going to have a quick look at the dictionary because I don't think I've ever actually used effective file name myself. I'm just <laughs> going to see what it says and see if I can explain it a bit better. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand when a file name would not be the actual file name. May uh, be when it doesn't have a file name yet, if that makes sense. Maybe. So let's see what it actually says here, because it is in the dictionary. I just need to read it and see what happens in that particular, <laughs> in that particular <laughs> case. Um, Ah, so it's probably um, if you're getting the file name of a substack. So the file name of a substack would be would usually be empty because it's a substack of the main stack. But the effective um, file name of the substack would uh, use the the name of the of the of the stack, and I assume sort of append um, append a part of the yeah. So it would just be the same as the, the file name of, of the stack, I think. Um, so again, that's a sort of inheritance thing, the same as a text size or a background color. You The, the sub stack would inherit the file name of the, of the stack that it's a part of, but it doesn't have its own file name set. So I think it's used for sub stacks, basically. Um, I think that would be the main so use for it. question. <laughs> Right, so Clarence would like more on sockets. Um, Andrew Bell would like to see some demonstrations of resizing and reorienting a stack in mobile, going from landscape to portrait. Shouldn't that just happen, or is there code that makes that work? It depends how you've got your stack set up. I assume he means that if you've got if you've got a nice portrait layout, then when you turn your your stack, your your device around, it would automatically change to a uh, landscape mode, but your field would still be tall and thin and on right. the left hand side, and there might yes. be a big gap on the right hand side. So it would be how to get the elements on your stack to automatically resize and reposition to fit the um, the orientation of the device. Which would be you could do quite a nice um, lesson probably on all the different options, the field screen the full screen mode options, the geometry manager, mm. resizing the script. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can see that could be a good, good topic. Yep, yep. 
so Rogers as a demo how to hook up the Merg externals would be great. Um, they're already there. Yeah, you shouldn't need to hook up the Merg externals at all. They should just be part of your, assuming that you have the version, the edition that has the Merg externals in them, because there's, I think there's a couple that are in community, Heather. The, I think Merg Jason's in all versions, and then there's some that are in yes. indie and some that are business only. Um, yes. You actually have to, to hook them up because all the, the functions and commands that are implemented by the Merg externals are part of your your distribution of your edition. Um, do, you, do you need to do something like start using? Or? No, no, you shouldn't have to do anything. You should. I think you should just be able to call just call Merg, those whatever. Yeah. Um, if it what a nice lesson might be would be to do something that's about how to use all the different Merg externals. Maybe some examples. That would be good. Yes. I'd like that. That I think that would be really good to cover because we don't have an awful lot about that. Yes. No, they're really yeah. useful. So maybe mm -hmm. more than like hooking them up, it's actually, you know, how to get the most out, how to use them, how to get the most out of them. Yeah. That'd be yeah. A really yeah. Lesson. Making a note of that. That's a very good we could do a series on that. Mm. I like that. Thank you, Roger. Yes, good idea. Uh so David Just Simpson's asking for more. <laughs> <laughs> passing info to and from a web page so that that yeah that's something we could cover uh so mikey wants to write uh, an ai and socket spam filter do you know that might be more than we could cover in an hour um, i don't know interesting Oh, good. Right. Okay. So web services. We did quite a lot of web services this year, Albert. I don't know if you've seen the the recordings, uh, but do go and have a look, especially Michael's sessions. Uh, Cyril, something on Live Code Server. Yes, that's good. Uh, Daniel, building a REST API with Live Code Server. Oh, there you go. Combining those two ideas. That's a possibility. Integrating out with Facebook and Twitter. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And Google+. Plus. Some of that's going to be covered with Live Code Connect, isn't it? Yeah, and some of those, there's actually some Merg stuff that you can use yes. already. I can't remember right. what remember what it's called. Is it Merg Social? Yes, Merg Social is. Yeah, yeah. So we we could do a we could do a presentation on that, and that would cover two things. Yeah, there's also some um, some things that you can do using. Um, oh, what are they called? I can't remember the name of them. I'm gonna have to look it up. Um, using custom URL schemes, you can do a bit with WhatsApp and things using custom URL schemes. So that could maybe all be rolled into one one nice lesson. Different ways of doing it. Okay, this is great. I mean, this is really good. I can see there's lots more coming, and we're running out of time now. So um, Brian says there's a demo I put up for that. Brian, what did you mean? Demo for what? Because that's worth knowing. Um, uh, more for beginners from Cyril, yes. Um, okay, so Roger Ellis has just meant really a demo of how they work and what they do. That was for the Merg external, so yes, that's good. Um, yeah, teaching the add ons for live code like Zygon Act Excel, library, and animation engine. Do you know we could actually see if we could get the vendors for those products to come and present on those? That would be good. Yeah. Oh, Brian says it was orientation he put the demo up for. OK, that's cool. That's cool. Um, OK, well, thank you very, very much, um, everybody. And I'm going to have to end this session. But I'm definitely going to save out this chat. That's uh, there's loads of good stuff here. Um, and we've got Dave Kilroy up next with some very interesting stuff and what he's been doing in the NHS. And yes, Cyril, I agree. Eleanor does do a wonderful job of explaining what she's doing. I, I, I watch these things and I think, oh, I could do that. But then I realize afterwards, maybe not. No, but, you could. <laughs> I could. I could, yes, if I had to. But I'm too busy helping all you lovely customers. So I'll let Eleanor carry on with that. All right, people. So come back in a couple of minutes where Dave will be here. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye to Eleanor for the very last time on this day six. So. Bye, Eleanor.
See you in Thank January, you. probably. <laughs> yes, I should think so. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Thanks, everyone.